Hello, everyone, on our YouTube channel and our podcast feeds. I am Dane Young from UGASports.com, and this is Around the League. We are back for our second season. This is the SEC-centric show. Alongside me are Jim Don and the College Football Hall of Famer and Brent Rollins from Pro Football Focus. And Brent, I'm going to let you kick it off uh, this season because we have two new sponsors, and uh, I'd love for you to tell us about Connor Grading and Landscaping. Yeah, so we actually, so one of the back and better than ever, we actually, you know, we got a couple of sponsors that saw what we were doing and wanted to join in. So we got first, we got Connor Grading out uh, of Monroe, Georgia, do a thing. Uh, head over to their Facebook page. Uh, it's, but I just saw that they did a big backyard piece, putting green type thing. Uh, so anything from being outside of your house, even grading from, from the start, work with whomever if you want to get them from the start and then use them through the end of your house completion. So uh, we got some, some product demonstration that the folks might want to see. Lane's Barbecue, this is so, uh, seasoning. Oh, we even got some, uh, some kind of sweet, the sauce and rubs that they have. So they are jumping on. And I know people that subscribe and, and watch the podcast that it's Go Dogs, G-O-D-O-D-A-W-G-S, uh, as a and I'll keep on uh, while we're doing this. But yeah, excited to be back to hear from Coach and roll and get this season rolling coach this is kind of the full sign for us that football season is here because uh, after this week we have college football happening and the sec coming here uh within a week now which is uh, pretty exciting for all of us so welcome back uh coach donovan to, to what we're doing here with around the league and for everyone just joining around the league atl that was intentional because the show is about the path to atlanta for SEC teams. Coach, just your overall thoughts about having a season uh, right around the corner. Well, one thing that uh, all of us are excited about is all the camp from the standpoint of, uh, even though they certainly have COVID restrictions and certainly going by a lot of different protocols, it just everybody is working at it pretty well. You know, I mean, it's pretty much like we've had in the past. Hopefully going to have stadiums and uh, app and recruiting starting to go 100% now where coaches had kids on campus and kids got able to make official visits. So it's, it's about as normal as it can be. You, you expect the teams to be ready to go a little bit more this year when they weren't as a team or doing Zoom meetings and things like that. I'm excited, you know, always to see how uh, our team's going to do, but also – Around the league, we've got four new coaches. Uh, we've got some teams coming back with some really good uh, rosters that finished the season well last year. And weekly, we'll be able to go over this and uh, put it out for all the fans that, that aren't necessarily new people and put it out there what we think about the rest of the league. So it's it's going to be a, a up for grabs this year probably than, than in the past in the West because Alabama's got some question marks, but uh, they certainly – a good team anyhow, but we'll, we'll we'll go over all that. I also want to reiterate how much we appreciate these two new sponsors, and we'll do all we can to promote them. And we got a lot of good fans out there that understand people and take care of our own. So good job by uh, Brent getting these sponsors, and we'll do all we can to help them get uh, people to, to use their stuff and. Uh, I'm probably need somebody to come over here pretty quick and do some grading around my house if it keeps raining like this. <laughs> we said all the time, support the people that support us. We'll tell you more throughout the show about Lane's Barbecue and Connor Grading and Landscaping, how you can contact them and they can uh, help out your tailgating needs, whether it's uh, on the road for Lane's Barbecue or at home with uh, Connor Grading and Landscaping. Uh, this could be, though, guys, the last season that the SEC is comprised of 14 teams. We'll get to that a little bit later on of what could uh, be happening in the next couple of years we will see uh, but what I want to start with is just quickly quick hitters on each team here so I'm going to limit you both 20 seconds coach I'm going to just say a team you're going to give me your general thoughts on that team and, and it's off season maybe projecting forward and Brent I want you to use your data mine and PFF information to give me a player to watch from each of those teams and coach we're talking about Alabama alphabetically number one but also uh, in rankings, number one, let's start with the reigning champion, Crimson Tide. The thing about the, this team, I, I think it's better is their defense is not going to be up as many points as they have. They won't have to outscore people. 
Uh, they certainly got some outstanding linebackers, as many as any team in the secondaries. Got a question mark to quarterback with a new guy, but he certainly got the pedigree. So Alabama team is going to have to win a little bit different than they have in the past, but they're still going to be able to roll tide. Brent, player to watch. Uh, Coach, just talk about the defense. It's Will Anderson. Will Anderson, Jr., who last year was a tr- one of the highest graded defensive players in the league. Had 60 back pressures, eight sacks. I, you, and, you know, the report, you hear how he's been in camp. You can see a person who's on the verge of being becoming that Bosa, um, like big-time elite pass rusher. Next up is the Arkansas Razorbacks year two for Sam Pittman, Barry Odom and company. Well, they certainly got it rolling there as far as the momentum. Everybody loves Sam Pittman. Three wins last year were certainly in them going. I think they got to do better on third down defensively, get off the field. They only had four ticks last year. Offensively, question mark, quarterback, can this guy step up? But they got a, a base of, of a football. And with the non-conference games, they'll probably have a good shot at making a bowl. Right. And that returning that returning players, Trey Burks, uh, for them, who big physical 6'3, 220 pound receiver, who you're looking at is quite possibly one of the highest graded re- receivers in all of college football. I think the third highest graded returning in all of co- college football was Trey Burks. The all Trey Burks. The Auburn Tigers uh, return a lot of talent on offense and some experience on defense. New coaching staff, though, coach. Yeah, bringing in Brian Harson. Uh, we'll talk about the coaches in a minute, but uh, they they got both quarter but question marks all their defense because they lost some good players. Uh, can they make enough bigs and stay on the field offensively? You know, with this new power running game, uh, they got some good players, but just I think Auburn's going to take a step back this year. Auburn best player okay. or player to watch, Brent. Yeah, as I say, if I asked you who is the m- most experienced and played the most snaps out of running SC back, would you answer is Bo Nix? Hmm. <laughs> it is. He's the most experienced returning quarterback. But outside of uh, the, the players in the secondary uh, that return, they added Ja'Shawn Miller from West Virginia. So secondary for them early, I think, keeps them in games. And their, their schedule to me is, is fun to look at and fun to think about because – you know, they got Penn State on the road. They got LSU on the road before they even play Georgia. Kicking it on down to the Bayou, Kojo, and those Tigers. Well, the Tigers got a lot of good players, and uh, certainly with, last year was just a, an anomaly there. But, uh, you know, I think the thing there is cohesive in defense. Mac Johnson, Max Johnson's coming back. I got a lot of good uh, – Skill people defensively is going to be the name for them. Can they stop people, get organized defensively with this new staff and, uh, you know, make people work, give up way too many easy last year? The player that watched defensively is, is Eli Ricks, who to me, you're looking at him as someone who challenged Derek Stingley as one of these top corners and see five star through the last played a ton as a true freshman. And like Coach said, with the coach, they're trying to get that sort of 2019 and Pete's and, and uh, Durante Jones who've worked under Joe Brady and Dave. You're trying to sort of recreate that 2019 for them. Historically, uh, Mike Leach teams make a, a large step forward in year two. Does that happen for Mississippi State? Yeah, I think they're better because they more established at quarterback, but they got to find some and play against these teams that drop eight and uh, – you, you know, just rush three and to be the ticket for them down the stretch last year. A lot of teams had them throw the ball in front of them. And they couldn't stay on the field. Uh, defensively, they really were a good team last year. I think they'll be much improved, whether their record will be it's, it's still to be said. Mike Leach is an excellent coach. And you're talking about that. And Martin Emerson, in terms of player to watch, the defensive who only allowed 56% completion, 12 pass breakups to watch. But we were talking about Coach Leach, and the, he's only averaged less than 30 in the last 20 years. He's only averaged less than 30 points three times. 
And that was the first season in each of his new, in each of his jobs at Texas Tech. And then last year with Miss State. So every, after that, he, every year, year these coach, he's been over 30 points a game. So it will be interesting to see if he can actually get there based on what coach was talking about with how defense has somewhat figured him out uh, in the SEC last year. What a stat that is. I mean, you don't get a sample size of 20 years much in college football, and that's uh, just a long storied career. My favorite game of the season every year is the Egg Bowl. Just so many narratives going into it. We just talked about Mississippi State, Ole Miss on the other side, Lane Kiffin in year two. Well, they certainly created a lot of buzz last year, although I think realistically their offense was much better than it was the year before, but their defense continued to just be terrible. And they had to outscore Eric, but, uh, you know, he's got everybody jacked up with the corral back, your quarterback. I don't know if he's got the morning cast that he had last year, lost some good players uh, to the draft, but uh, it's going to be a big jump for them defensively if they're going to make a move in the league, though. Just can't continue to hope to outscore everybody. You look at the game that they played against Arkansas, weren't hitting in all cylinders and had all the turnovers. You're going to have it like that, but they got a reason to be excited when you got a quarterback like Corral, though. Very much so. And like Coach was saying, with the loss of offense, Elijah Moore and Kenny Yabo that were picked in Moore last year caught 86 of 100 targets. He got 85% of the passes that were thrown his way, he caught. Uh, so replacing that production key. But in terms of watch, uh, I'm going to give a name that, that Georgia fans know a little bit about, uh, former dog. Otis Reese and their defense has nowhere to go but up and and he's going to play quickly after being eligible and and he's going to play a lot more this year and they're going to do anything to get stops on the defensive side and then finally in the SEC West probably the darling if uh, most people were looking beyond Alabama for a potential SEC West champion and that's Texas A&M uh, Jimbo Fisher seemed like he made a, a step forward last year only one place to go from here yeah, I mean, they were close last year, nine and one else to uh, Alabama, and uh, haven't gotten within 30 points of Alabama since Jimbo's been there. So uh, they gonna, they made the move. They're uh, going to go with Haynes, I saw, at quarterback. So big issue. We got great receivers coming back, a big tight end, all-American type. Offensive line, got to replace some people, but their defense should be really good again, and they got a good kicking game. A&M really should be the team to challenge in the West. Just they have talent every every level, offensive receiver. They in terms of top end. While well, well, I think Georgia has the obviously has the deepest backfield in the SEC, A&M might have the, sort of those top two guys with you know, Spiller and then A Chain. There's a player to watch, Devin A Chain, who you saw in the bowl game. Just very like I, I, I originally being from West Virginia, he was very Noel Divine like. Uh, package but uh, insane level of speed so it, it, it consistent play from the quarterback position this year w with Haynes King being named the starter and, and you know adding a bit of a dual threat element much like Kellen Mon had they're gonna they're gonna cause some noise because they are supremely talented everywhere else I want to give a quick shout out to Billy Wright here on our YouTube chat just saying that uh, he loves the shows that we're putting out every week and thank you coach Donner for making time to do this so thank you Billy Thank hey, you, Billy. Billy. Really appreciate it, but uh, we certainly enjoy. Uh, we're just doing what the three of us like to do instead of uh, just talking among ourselves. We're actually on this channel, but uh, it's a good idea to talk about the other teams. So, and it makes me have to do a little prep. Uh, both you guys are always on top of it. I'm I'm pretty much behind on the rest of the league, but trying to catch up here. Well, we're on to the SEC East and the team that we all talk about quite often. Let's quickly get it out there, in Georgia. Well, Georgia's got all the elements, uh, you know, have had a couple injuries, but particularly a receiver uh, when you look at Pickens being out. But I like the power game they've got. I like the quarterback that's coming back in JT Daniels. The big question for me defensively, replacing all these secondary guys that went to those, uh, playing the ball in the air, uh, being cohesive, making the calls. If Georgia can play only on, on – uh, on the secondary level, they'll be a really great football team because they got a tremendous kicking game and a power running game on offense. In terms of watch, to me, it's which one of the soft receivers and the true freshmen 
takes a leap. Uh, whether that's Jermaine Burton, Marcus Rosemary Jackson, Aaron Smith, or Adonai Mitchell, that's kind of making some waves as a true freshman. One of the wide receivers is going to have to take a leap to, to really put them to me in the category of a national championship type team. After game one, they're going to be double digit favorites practically the rest of the way. So it's game one's going to, and we're going to talk ad nauseum about that, especially next week. But uh, that to me, and then also the biggest thing I want to see is with, with the way we've talked about all off season, how offensive football has sort of become the main focus of, of winning at a high level in game one, is there, is there a fourth and three on their own 43 where Kirby's going to have to decide, all right, is this an offensive game offense on the field or is this going to, am I still going to just punt and trust my D like that? I, I'm very curious to see how that works with, especially playing who they're playing in the opener against Clemson. To answer your first question, I cannot wave the flag harder for Marcus Roseman Jackson than I have been this offseason. I think he's probably the guy that you're looking for. Although, look, Jermaine Burton was clutch for Georgia in multiple spots last year. So it's a tough spot with some of the injuries and some of the absences, but there's some talent there too. Let's move on to the Florida Gators, uh, replacing a lot of offensive production, Coach. Yeah, they really – of course, Kyle Trapp, unbelievable two years there uh, running the club and – can't, you know, I'm not going to go through everybody they lost, but, you know, I'm an Emory Jones fan. I think he's a lot better passer than people give him credit for. I watched him camp and watched him in high school. I mean, he, he's not just a running quarterback. He can throw the ball down the field. Uh, they, they, their big question's always been offensive line of, of the caliber that they need, but they've been so good skill-wise that they can throw the ball. But I look for him to go back to a lot of Mississippi State stuff that uh, – Coach Mullen did with the quarterback pre and runs uh, with Fitzgerald and and uh, Dak Prescott. Uh, defensively, they got to do. They can't do any worse with all the points they gave up. Uh, they got to find somebody to play the other corner uh, across from Elam. But uh, I think the Florida Gators going to take a step back, but they're still going to be probably the second best team in the East. I think Coach is right in, in terms of player to watch. I think it is Emory, and I say because. Uh, some of my colleagues at PFF have been given Emory a love uh, as a dark horse Heisman type and, and somebody that uh, are very much watching this year. I want to see it. I want to see it on a consistent week, week basis. And the big order for me this year is obviously all, they lost all the weapons and some of the things that coach talked about, but their schedule, their schedule now, now has Bama, LSU, Georgia uh, in sort of not necessarily consecutive, but there's, Teams there, and then also Florida State. Florida State, and Mackenzie Milton kind of does his thing, and they feel themselves sort of in the year. So their schedule is a lot more difficult than it was a season ago. So I, I think they're, like Coach said, possibly take that back. Jones is going to be the key. Uh, Dan Molinoff, back is going to drive how well they do. The unsung team in the SEC East, at least if you're just looking for someone that kind of punch above their weight a little bit, it's probably Kentucky, Coach, and uh, maybe for good reason with their work in the trenches the last few seasons. Yeah, I think we, uh, if you're a Kentucky fan, this might be, you know, you had a better football team than you did basketball team last year, and it might be the same thing again. This team is really geared up on the offensive lines, good players. And, you know, they've gotten through the last couple of years with just running the ball without any threat of the pass. And I think uh, bringing in this uh, new core from the Rams, they're certainly going to do some, uh, you, know, you know, concepts that maybe help the quarterback. They got the quarterback transfer from Penn State. So if they can get any passing game, I'm just talking about rudimentary passing game to go with this power running game they got, they're going to be a threat in their schedule where they've got – Three lay down non conference game out of Louisville, but uh, they got this kind of schedule that they can do some damage this year. Very much so. And then and they get Florida at home, they get LSU at home. And, you know, interesting coach talks about the coordinator piece. So I, I went diving into some data because so the Rams, Liam, Liam Cohen is their new offensive coordinator, comes from the Rams. He was actually sort of all American at the University of Massachusetts uh, when he was in college. And his, but his only offensive coordinator experience is at the University of Maine. And then he's been in the NFL and mostly. But with the Rams, the interesting part is, so I looked up, in terms of percentage of plays that were in the shotgun, yes. 
they averaged was right around 77 to 80% over the past three years. The Rams over the past three years were only in the shotgun for 42 their plays. The teams that that do that do lower than that in college, there's academies and people that were options. So you're going to see, like, Kentucky, if they follow that Rams mode, outside zone, under center play action, they're going to look in different than what a lot of teams are used to seeing in and around the league. Yeah, that's going against the grain for sure. That's some good stuff there, Brent. I did not realize that uh, about his past. We'll see what he brings in his own system when he's calling the shots and uh, not someone higher up with the Rams. So quite quite interesting there. Uh, same thing with uh, Missouri. Bit of an offensive shift in identity last year. Uh, year two of Lyle Drinkwitz. May have had a pause here on the feed. Let's see if this comes back here. In that, and he said, well, "Watch the tape on. They're really doing some good things." And I watched the tape, and then all of a sudden they they hired Chip Kelly. So I went on the ESPN Sports Center. I knew all about Chip. Nobody in the country didn't even talked about him. And I gave him a big big plus there because they really did some great things in New Hampshire. And you saw what he did at Oregon as the coordinator and the head coach. A lot of these guys are just waiting for the opportunity. They just got to get out there and sh- strut their stuff. I think we had a bit of a internet interference maybe on my end. Um, let's see, who are we talking about there just now, Coach? We were just talking about Kelly. Uh, you know, do we need to start that over or what? No. Okay. I, I think we're good. Uh, can we go on to Missouri then? Yes. Yeah, let's, let's go to the show me here. Uh, Missouri really good year last year. I mean, nobody thought they would uh, win that many games, and they had a couple upsets. But, you know, quarterback ended a real difference for them. Uh, they scored points, and defensively they brought in a new coordinator who actually has been a head coach in the mood. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, – I would think that Missouri, just because of the morale and the way the state's rallying around them and all, has a chance to maybe make that next step and win a couple more games. But at the same time, they're not going to surprise anybody. And, uh, you know, they're in a division where, beside playing Georgia and Kentucky, and uh, you got to beat those other teams. You, if you beat all the others in your division, you're in pretty good shape with your non-conference games. If they can run the table against Tennessee and South Carolina and, and uh, you know, Vanderbilt, that three wins right there. In terms of players for from, from Missouri, it's such an interesting question because they had so much go out and so much come in. They had a lot of transfer both in and out. Uh, Mookie Cooper that came from Ohio State is probably one to but Just an unknown on the offensive side because playmakers, for the most part, other than Tyler Beatty back at running back, are gone. So if they can, they just have to find playmakers. It'll be in a lot of sort of turnover roster in, in year two. Uh, a team with a lot of turnover as well, and we're getting to the trio of SEC East teams with new head coaches. It begins with South Carolina, a, a new regime over there in Columbia. Yeah, South Carolina is a situation where uh, talent-wise, uh, you know, they really got a couple really big-time guys the D-line. And uh, but you know lost lost some guys to the draft and one of their best corners left and went to Florida State. So I, I just think that uh, quarterbacks with Doty being out, uh, you know he's a good runner, but uh, he's still got to prove he can pass. You know they got the good back in Harris and and they got the kid that hurt his leg the year before to be a good back too. So I think South Carolina can at a situation where they got three games there. Vanderbilt, Tennessee, uh, you know, uh, all of those three teams got to play each other. And can you win two of those and then hope you win some non-conference games? Because I just don't see them being that competitive against the rest of the league. And didn't someone pick them in the East? There was one vote, if I, if I remember right. I don't yeah, remember. They're, I'm they're, not sure. They, uh, they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle. In terms of players to watch, coach said the backs are, are really the, the only offensive threats that you would know with Kevin Harris and Marshawn Lloyd coming off the knee injury. He'll be interesting to see because he was very, very recruited back for them. 
uh, and someone that they beat beat some other bigger schools for. But I mean, the interesting thing with with being there, how much of Oklahoma's of style does he bring it entire? He changes a little bit. That would be interesting to see. But yeah, they're going to struggle. Their their talent is not needs to be, and and I'm it's. Likely a similar story over on Rocky Top for Tennessee, first year of Josh Heupel and company. Uh, a lot of new guys on that roster. Yeah, I mean, uh, I need a real uh, – one of those pads to look at their team. I know, you know, they lost over 20 guys in the transfer portal. Some really good players. I mean, Oklahoma's got two guys starting for them from Tennessee, Alabama. Got the linebacker. I mean, you look around the country, North Carolina's – Got one of their running backs. I mean, they lost some premium players. The guy recruited pretty well up there, uh, Coach Pruitt. Um, it, you know, Josh Heupel has a pedigree of, uh, you know, run, running a fast offense and getting them, uh, you know, did a really good job at uh, Missouri scoring points when he came in there. But I think the big question here is, that, is with that fast-paced offense, can their defense do anything to uh, not give up as many points as they're probably going to do? Guys coming in from Penn State as the coordinator going to have to adjust to this league. We'll just have to see. A lot of question marks there at Rocky Top. Right. Including who plays quarterback. You have Hendon Hooker transfer from Virginia Tech. You have the Milton kid that transferred from Michigan. And then you have Harrison Bailey that was in-house. So who plays quarterback for them? They haven't really named a starter yet. Uh, and like Coach said, there's offensive pedigree there. Heifel, even in the SEC, Heifel averaged a game with, with uh, at Missouri. There is the pedigree. And they actually do what he wants to do offensively where he is. But who knows? But I think that he's going to be in a little different situation than he is than he was at UCF. I'm not going to believe that it's a different Tennessee quarterback other than Jared Garantano until I see it on the field. For some reason, I still think he's going to trot out there for another year. Uh, final team in the SEC East is Vanderbilt. Yeah, you know, Clark Lee uh, has a good degree. Uh, he's done a good job as a defensive coordinator around the country coming in there from Notre Dame. The one thing about it, when you're a graduate of the school where you take over, you know, the pluses and minuses. In, but so got to convince the the uh, people there that what's been going on is not working. So we got to change some things. I don't think they're going to change their academics, that's for sure. But, you know, they're working hard to get a new facility there for the building. They're doing all these. But the difference in Clark Lee taking over and when Mason took over, I just thought uh, there were better players there at Vanderbilt. Uh, you know, with it, that we're playing. And they had a pretty good run there under uh, Franklin. And then they had some pretty good players early, Mason. But the last couple of years, their team, just not competitive athletic-wise on the field. And uh, hopefully they'll get some, some, you know, some transfers. But I guarantee you, uh, four coaches, this guy with a defensive background has a chance to maybe help this team. Do they win a game? That's the question for me. But the, I mean, that, at least a conference game. Can they win a conference game this year? That almost would be a, a victory for them to me because in terms of talent, like Coach said, the, the, the talent is just – there There are a couple of, of guys that you could say keep your eye on, but overall the talent is just not there right now. Now, one one of the interesting hires that, that Clark Lee made, I thought, was the uh, the hire of the uh, one of the former recruiting guys, the Bar Barton Simmons, that's – recruiting that does personnel for them you know that, that's someone who knows your reputation in and around the entire southeast and the country and and someone who can help build it and, and looks like from a recruiting standpoint someone else that has a good reputation are friends at connor grading and landscaping based out of monroe if you have an outside project whether it's your driveway whether it's your yard just check them out over on their Facebook page. You can see some of the recent photos of the work that they've done. Uh, you can give them a call at 770-639-3149. Connor Grading and Landscaping over in Monroe. I can tell you all the great things about them and their customer service and the way that they handle themselves and uh, get the projects done, even in short windows, whether it's based on weather or other factors involved. 
but I can let Brent Rollins do that because he has the personal experience. He's actually had them work uh, over near his home. So Brent, uh, just tell me about your experience with Connor grading and landscaping. And fantastic from day one. And, and I wouldn't have actually got the CEO to move in my house, help me out in the, in the, at the last minute there with, with the landscape. And they've done every, every landscaping project uh, in and around my house. And, and I can't thank them enough for the work they've done been prompt uh, and very served. Mike Connor, the owner, and owner he's, he's always really quick to hit me back and take care of any and all issues that we have. So good people uh, and great to work with. Thanks, Mike Connor, for supporting us. And check out their Facebook page. That's Connor Grading and, and Landscaping based out of Monroe, Georgia. Coach, we talked about some of those first-year head coaches coaches and I want to hit those quickly and just kind of get your thoughts on uh, what they're bringing to their teams what their past says they they can do so let's start with former Georgia assistant Shane Beamer who does take over for the South Carolina Gamecocks well Shane was a fan favorite uh, uh, you know it's one of the things that helped him get the job uh, a lot of the South Carolina uh, ex players got behind him and and you know he he was there when Spurrier was doing well uh you know, I think the big thing is uh, staff. You know, he had big staff turn right off the bat, lost some hired. But, you know, these young guys that he hired, he's got a past with them, and they, they can, they're just going to have to, you know, bite the bullet a little bit till they get some players. I know he'll work hard at recruiting. He never was very successful recruiting here at Georgia, but, uh, you know, as far as an individual recruiter. But, you know, he's had a past where he, he's been involved with recruiting at some different places. But uh, the question mark for me is, can they get some players in there? If they do, uh, they'll, they'll be okay. But you got to look at it like this. The two biggest rivals they got are in the top five in the country now and everything. These players, coaching, everything, Clemson and Georgia. So they got a tough road to hope. Well, and Brent, on top of that, you had North Carolina to the north that has really revamped their program, makes it even tougher for South Carolina. Yeah, it's, it's what, what do you deem as success? If you, you know, if success has to be, all right, you're an SEC championship game type contender team like you were with Spurrier for a few years. I don't know if you're going to get there right now. You're going to have to do a lot of work and, and like Coach said, talent in uh, to make sure that you get to those levels. We talked about Tennessee for a minute. Josh Heupel, first year head coach with the Vols. Well, Josh has the ground playing quarterback at Oklahoma, being the coordinator there and at uh, and he has some presence as far as coaching at Missouri where he was the coordinator, and he actually did a great job with Drew Locke there when he was younger quarterback, and then he left and took to UCF. He's got the head coaching uh, background with three years at UCF, although their team tended to go from here down a little bit. They, they didn't progress. They their, their defense still had some real issues, but I think uh, – he certainly got uh, the offensive package if he can get some players to go with it. Brent, what do you see from a hypo based on what he did at UCF? It's just the kind of what we talked about earlier. It's it's can you do what you want to do? Uh, in the, can you run at that tempo? Can you run at that pace? Do the things that you want to do? Because one of the things that actually UCF has had is they've had pretty good players at the quarterback position. You got to find that guy, and, and you know they got three options. This, who's going to be the guy for him uh, to run his system and run it how he wants. And then Coach Clark Lee at Vanderbilt, homecoming for him. We know the challenges of coaching at Vanderbilt in the SEC, but uh, it seems like he's a guy that's passionate about that university. The thing about being the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame, you, you've got a chance to have a, a look at some of these jobs. So for him to go on and take that Vanderbilt job made me think that he thought they had a shot they can't do anything but go up. I mean, uh, that, that, that team uh, went down every year in the last four or five years. I mean, they kept the coach, but they, they never were very threatening to anybody. Uh, I think the big thing there is just get your type of player, try to avoid losing. By that, I mean, don't beat yourself. Be a smart team. Get a couple of breaks and win some non-conference game and get a little momentum. But, you know, history will tell you that Vanderbilt – He's going to always struggle in this league. Very true. Brent, what do they do? It, it, I'll say at least the, the thing with the Vanderbilt, though, is at least I think with a new staff and sort of a new energy, 
expenditures I think that will happen that maybe didn't happen in the past. And also, you know, Nashville can be possibly a, a pull. It's one of the fastest growing cities in, in America. And, and there's lots and lots of resources and lots and lots of people coming in. And if you can have that one little moment of success, that, that James Franklin you know, type year that you had, that maybe then that you get that momentum going, but obviously it's going to take two, three years to even get to that. One then, thing that James Franklin had going for him, I think more than anything, was Tennessee was down. Uh, Kentucky really wasn't doing much. They were starting to build. Georgia was up and down. Uh, Florida had some issues. I mean, he was in the league at the right time and took advantage of it, you know, winning the state championship, beating Tennessee like he did, and getting those eight wins a couple of years. And then he said, hi, adios. I mean, but I will say this, Bob, you know, Coach Bobby Johnson really did a good job recruiting there. They had some – some players there that when you look at the guys that they sent to the pros, I mean, that to me is an indicator because if you don't have guys that are getting drafted or that are at least getting a chance as a free agent, how are you going to compete against the Georgias and the Alabamas? Cause that's who they got. That's such a good point about the timing because you look at previous years, how a team like Missouri won the SEC East back-to-back years. It takes some luck from the rest of the league having some issues too, and Missouri was at that moment to capitalize at that time. And uh, I think that's what these three teams would need in over and over and over again to, to be able to compete at the top. Uh, so the other one I, in the SEC, the new coach that a bit of a kind of off the board hire, he, he was not rumored in the coaching search, at least at first, Brian Harson at Auburn. And, Coach, I, I think one thing you can say about him is while he may not be from the South or of the South, he made sure that his staff was. Yeah, one of the things about Harson, he you know he's done a good job at Boise State. And, uh, you know, he's been under Chris Peterson. And, um, you know, he had a chance to coach a couple years there for uh, Mac Brown. And he has a, a really good record. But, but I think, to me, coming into this league, you're not going to out-coach any of these guys in this league like maybe you did in, in that conference. You're not going to, uh, you know, scheme everybody back and forth. There's just too many players. You, you know, coaching won't win for you, but it'll get you beat. If you're not as good at coach as these other guys, then it'll hurt. But you just got to understand that it's your system and all. It's good, but coming in here and uh, challenging Nick Saban and Kirby Smart, two biggest rivals, it's going to be a real, uh, real tough deal. Hiring Mike Bobo was really good because he's got a background in the league. Uh, Cadillac was recruiting. Uh, but Mason, to me, you know, still got to prove he can in this league as a defensive coordinator. He did some good things at Stanford, but he didn't do hardly anything at uh, – when he took over the defense at Vanderbilt, so I think he brought his backer coach with him from Vanderbilt. That'll probably help, but on him as far as how he's going to do with the defense. And they lost a lot of good players, and he's replacing the guy in Steele, who probably was one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. Auburn right now, talent-wise, is, is on a downer compared to what I've seen there. And you got to think, if he's there eight years, can he beat him three times like Miles on did? Can he win CC West and the SEC championship like Miles on? Uh, have to see, but uh, I think it's a situation that he's off to a bad start when he's got COVID here the week before the first game too. And, you know, we'll see how that works out. Well, and Brent, Coach mentioned earlier how South Carolina has Clemson and Georgia, you know, recruiting and performing like gangbusters, uh, top two rivals. Same thing for Auburn with Alabama and Georgia. Very much so. And there, I think a good start is going to be very key for him. Because when you said when you come from the outside uh, in a way and you, you're not a unconventional hire, it's not somebody that you heard much in the media, you need some success early. And they go to Penn State three. You got to, you know, go win that game. Go win that game. Go come home, compete. Crazy LSU at home. Maybe even be 5-0 and heading into Georgia. Uh, but, you know, that's obviously we'll, we'll get to see that on the field here soon. 
I've got two more topics I want to hit before we wrap up. And uh, coach, I want to start with just a lot of new coordinators and assistant coaches, new faces and new places. We've mentioned a lot of them. Brent earlier mentioned Liam Cohen at Kentucky. We just mentioned Mike Bobo and Derek Mason uh, at Auburn. Are, are there any coordinators or assistant coaches that have kind of caught your eye? I know in, in the case of Alabama, there's some guys that you've coached with. Yeah, I think in the case of Alabama, you know, Bill O'Brien has such a history being a coordinator for uh, for the uh, New England Patriots, uh, being the head coach at Penn State, uh, being the head coach and general manager of Texas, Texans. So he's got a background to come in there and take over for Sarkeesian, who had really a big year last year. But I think system-wise that they're going to stick within the system that uh, Nick likes. But a lot to the table. I mean, it's hard to get a guy that's got that much experience and then brings in Doug Marone as old line coach who was a coach for me here and really good recruiter. He's off to start there recruiting some great offensive linemen. So I think those two guys will help Alabama. I don't think they'll miss a beat there. Uh, you know, around the league, though, uh, there's a uh, you know, not anybody else that really jumps at me. I'm the guy at Kentucky. We'll see how he does. But you got so many new guys coaching at the uh, at the other place. I'd say one guy to me that's on the hot seat a little bit that, that everybody in Arkansas is all in love with is Barry Odom. And maybe he's not on the hot seat because, you know, they, but they couldn't go field last year. They had two games. They had one in the fourth quarter where they do anything on defense. Uh, only moved their scoring defense two points from the year. I just think that they're getting a lot of credit for defense down there to me that really isn't very productive. Whether they'll be better this year, who knows, but he certainly has a background in defense, but uh, that's what hurt him. Missouri as a head coach, they couldn't really get their defense good. But uh, I would say watch what happens with, with uh, Arkansas's defense this year. And hopefully for Sam Pittman and for Odom, they'll play better because I think their offense is going to be pretty good. Brent, any assistance catching your eye? I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the new crew down at LSU as well. Yeah, the offensive side of that with, with Pete's, uh, who, who com, comes from the Joe Brady and comes from that and comes with the Panthers. And what they had in 2019 was obviously insanely special. And do you try to recreate that exact offense? Do you even have the personnel to even come close to, to doing that? Who knows? Because who knows play, who's the second receiver for them after uh, Christian Butte. So I, I do think they have a good quarterback in place with Max Johnson who can give a at least an element. Burrow could a win necessary run element so they could do a lot of the things there. It, it would just be interesting to see how he does handling the play calling for you know at that level. Something else that's insanely special. Lane's Barbecue. Support the people that support us. Uh, this is a spellbound. This is their rub season. It's what I like the most at Lane's Barbecue are the rubs and the, the spice blend that they come together. Uh, they've got the, the savory. They've got the sweet. Uh, this is probably a little bit of both with some white sugar, brown sugar, salt, pepper, garlic, chili powder. Uh, there's some other great stuff in here. This would go good on anything. It would probably make almost anything taste good uh, at your tailgate this year. Get you some Spellbound. Uh, you can get their original seasonings. Here's one that is the Kapalua, the Hawaiian seasoning, kind of specialty for fish. Lane's Barbecue. It is uh, made in Bethlehem, Georgia. So it's a Northeast Georgia product. You can find it all over the state. You can go to their website. You can check out their Instagram and their Facebook page. I actually did a little PR for Lane's Barbecue in one of my previous jobs. Got to know those uh, guys and, and women that are professionals over there. Just tremendous people. They love Georgia. They love what they do. They do a great job of exploring new flavors with their uh, smokers and barbecue. This is the real deal y'all get it for your tailgate it is lane's barbecue and if you go to their website right now you can get 15 percent off with the promo code go dogs that's g-o-d-a-w-g-s lane's barbecue my mouth is watering coach you talk about mouth watering players <laughs> i'm thinking about mouth ordering barbecue question i think everybody get 15 percent off that's a nice uh, little lick there for everybody to, uh, that watches this program, go get it. 
That's Lane's Barbecue. Again, it's a Northeast Georgia product. Support the people that support our shows, Lane's Barbecue and Connor Grading and Landscaping. Final topic that I want to hit, Texas and Oklahoma are to join the SEC at some point. Obviously not for this upcoming season. We'll see if it's next year or the year after or the year after, but it's a coming. And uh, Coach, we, we have talked ad nauseum about how the league may be shifting, but just overall, what this means for the SEC with the additions of Texas and Oklahoma when we do around the league in coming years, we'll be talking about them. Yeah, in terms of baseball, you know, you've got sacrifice flies and singles and all. The grand slam for us. I mean, the SEC is just taking on a, a national stature there with these two programs. And the reason I think it helps you more than anything is just the fact your scheduling is going to be enhanced so much to help you. Because everybody wants to get us. We're, just, we're not sure how it's going to come out, you know, how many teams or all that. But if, if you've got a 12-team playoff and you've got Oklahoma and Texas in your league, you're going to have games there or at least one game against them to help your national pro. And we're going to have three or four teams from our league jumping in that playoff. And uh, everybody else in the country is scrambling right now. I mean, they're talking about things. Uh, you know, off the cuff and on the cuff and making these agreements with these signed contracts and all that. But, you know, the, the SEC's up here and the rest of the leagues are lower than well manure right now as far as where they are going forward. Brent, what do you see with recruiting, with marketing, just the footprint of the SEC expanding? I don't think I can say any better than Coach just did right there. <laughs> it's <laughs> when you, you know, that – they are what they are. It, and, you know, the phrase they use, the, this just means more, or it just means more, you know, it, it just does. And then you're adding two places where it just means more to them too. So, you know, it, it, it's just going to be better for the league. I, I just like the playoff to me, the more the merrier, have more fun, have more games, have more great atmospheres. I love sports. And this just makes it more fun. Secretly, I just know that Coach Donnan likes having Oklahoma where he can talk about them even a little bit more. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go into that, Dane, but I mean, realistically, if we had West Virginia in the league, uh, Brent would be jumping up and down doing cartwheels. But I think the main thing that everybody needs to understand is you get a chance to go to Norman, Oklahoma, one of the most hallowed grounds in college football, to Austin, Texas, and with all the tradition and all the players, of, uh, Third and Earl, Earl Campbell, uh, the Iceman Trophy win there and uh, Vince Young, all those players, the town of Austin has got to be one of the best places ever. To That's just going to enhance the, the footprint of our league in Dallas, the uh, San Antonio markets, uh, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma City. I mean, it's just going to help uh, in a lot of ways. And the thing that I keep bringing, to, it's not just football. The other sports are going to flourish having this extra money because – you know, we don't have any any way to uh, supplement these uh, some of these sports sometime without TV money and things like that. But, hey, when the gymnastics team wants to fly somewhere, when the tennis team wants to get some extra, uh, stay one extra night or whatever it might, uh, they don't have the, the finances to, to do that without uh, the football revenue. So I think all our sports are going to really b- benefit and the quality of teams that Oklahoma and Texas bring in these Olympic sports, uh, Oklahoma's uh, in gymnastics, national champion softball, uh, golf. Texas won the athletic director's trophy last year as the best overall program in the country for all sports. So our other sports flourish too, getting these uh, teams to play against. That's a really good point just about the the overall impact it's going to have in athletics really around the country, uh, but specifically for the schools. So the future is bright in the SEC. The present is pretty darn good itself, and that's what we're here to talk about on a weekly basis here on Around the League. It's going to be on this YouTube channel and on our podcast feeds on Thursdays. And, uh, again, thank you to Lane's Barbecue. I told you to go to their Instagram page. That is a piece of steak seasoned with their Kunami. And if you're uh, watching on YouTube, you can see – Uh, I'm holding up to my camera right now, and uh, man, that'll make your uh, mouth water getting set for the week. We will begin uh, previewing specific games 
next week. That's this Thursday, wherever you listen to Around the League, whether that's Spotify, Apple Music, uh, Apple Podcast, uh, or right here on our YouTube channel. For the Hall of Fame head coach, Jim Donnan, and from Pro Football Focus, Brent Rollins, I am Dane Young. Thank you for listening to what we'll call Week Zero of Around the League.